Thanks very much. Um, I know I got the graveyard shift, so um, I thought I will try to spice things up a little bit, hence the topic I picked up. Because uh, let me give you a little bit, a little bit of background. I was born in a country that no longer exists. Okay, I was born in a city that no longer has the same name. I'm a product of a educational system that no longer exists. My school had a number. So I think I have a slightly different view that um, what happens in the industry and what happens in the, uh, in the world, in the Western world particularly, as a whole, because of, because of that background. And that's why I picked the uh, topic, what to do if you want your digital transformation to fail. Um, you see, um, as a side job, I'm a managing director of a technology company, but uh, as a main job, I'm a father. I have two kids, one is seven, the other one is three, and uh, I love them to bits. They drive me insane. <laughs> there hasn't been, I can, I can, I can see that a lot of people have the same problem. You see, there hasn't been a day when anything, something happened where they basically make me completely bonkers and willing to just run out of the house and scream. It not surprise anyone that's true. So, one day uh, I'm trying to convince my elder son to do his homework, and I created a whole logical story of why he has to do his homework, why by the simple fact of doing his maths, he would actually be ultimately happy and successful and will have a really good life. And all of a sudden, I hear crying from my younger daughter. And uh, oh, what might have happened? And then she said, well, Daddy, I don't have homework, so that means I'm not going to be successful. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, Jesus. <laughs> I completely locked it up. <laughs> I really need to address this fear of failure. And then fear of failure is, is something like this, you know, it, it actually is very, very powerful. So I was starting to think about the uh, definition, you know, what is fun, what is fun work, what is successful life. And bringing you back here a bit. When you hear the term digital transformation, what it is you think about? Is it blockchain? Is it an app? Is it a piece of software? Is it a process? Is it uh, a group of people who are sitting somewhere in Google headquarters and creating a certain miracle that will make our life better? Here is what I think about it. Or maybe this. Because from my point of view, there's no such thing as digital transformation. It doesn't exist. It's a myth. What we're actually dealing with here is a change. The world has changed. It, it is changing. When we're sitting here, it is changing. There's something happening that changes the world. It will change the way we do business. It will change the way our lives are going on. And uh, that is important to understand. Because according to recent reports by Rapporteur, then, um, in uh, cooperation with Microsoft UK and the workplace, seventy percent of all the digital transformation projects done in the UK are not going to reach their intended outcome. Think mm -hmm. about it: seventy percent. The whole industry of digital transformation amassed around one trillion dollars in uh, spent in twenty eighteen. Seventy percent of that is a lot of money wasted. So what I wanted to talk about is, okay, 70% is a hell of a lot of money. Let's aim that. Let me tell you how you can completely fail the whole thing. Because it's easy. You see, I'm a lazy person. I want to do stuff which is easy. I don't want to talk about how to be successful because I don't know that. But I do know how to fail. And I'm going to tell you. Rule number one, which is probably going to be very strange coming from uh, someone who works for a company which is essentially outsourcing, is outsourcing. Completely, utterly, outsourcing. Because it's not your job to do this. There are people, there are consultancies, there are whole companies whose job is to transform you. You probably recognize that. 
It's a tragedy of Shakespearean proportions. Hertz hired Accenture to do a certain job in digital space. And 32 million later, and around 12 months later, they are taking each other to court. <laughs> Why? Hertz is saying, well, they haven't done what we wanted them to. Accenture is saying, we've done exactly what you told us to. It's not our fault. You didn't know what you wanted. How many of you have that conversation, being on either side of the fence? A lot, I think. So, right, what to do about it? I love fairy tales, because I have kids, and because I have a kid at heart. And there's, uh, in uh, Russian folk um, culture, there's a fairy tale, uh, which can be loosely translated as, uh, go somewhere, I don't know where, bring me something, I don't know what. This could be the motto of a lot of transformational, digital transformational projects in the world. Outsource it, I beg you. Outsource it. Find someone who knows better than you how to run your business. Find someone who knows better than you who your clients are, and most importantly, who your clients are not. Because then you will fail. I guarantee that. We had a client um, who wanted to create a blockchain system. Client is NASDAQ, the blockchain system was for their trading floor in Philadelphia. And that was a couple of years ago when blockchain was the fashion of the year. Everyone wanted to do blockchain. <laughs> the big difference between a lot of other companies and NASDAQ in that particular case is they were not looking for partners who actually tell them what to do with blockchain. They actually knew exactly what they're trying to do. They needed something that will keep the information they have in the form that will be really hard to mess up with, and they will be able to completely and reliably trace the provenance of every security backwards or Blockchain. They did a project, we did a project for them, we delivered, they run it themselves now, we don't have a maintenance contract. We probably rolled ourselves a couple of million dollars, but we have a very loyal client who's not afraid to talk about us, who is not afraid of allowing us to mention them as a client on our website. That's worth a lot more than a maintenance contract. Right, so we successfully navigated, hopefully, or maybe not hopefully, successfully navigated past the uh, rule one, and uh, now I have another proposition. Create long-term plans, like really long-term, five years. If you can, 10 years even better. Very, very detailed, and stick to them. There's a reason you created these plans. There's a reason you had 25 committees working on them. There's a reason you've done all that work. It shouldn't really go to waste. Some of you might recognize this gentleman. He knew something about planning and winning. He said, planning is everything. Lens of nothing. His name is Dwight Eisenhower. And as I said, he does know something about planning. Why? Because in reality, plans that you create, they become irrelevant probably within 25 nanoseconds after you've done it. Because when you start on the road, when you start as a business, when you start new business, when you start transforming your existing business, this is how the future looks to you, right? It's an empty street. There are no trams there. This is San Francisco, by the way. There are lots of trams. There's no one there. You can clearly see where you're going. You see that skyscraper in the back? That's where you're going. That's where we're going. That's, that's, the, that's the destination. Give it 10 minutes. It's going to look like this. When you look at that picture, what do you see? Do you see your destination? Not really. You see people, you see obstacles. You start thinking about things such as, oh, I need to make sure I slow around that guy with the rucksack and make sure I'm not killed by the suitcase because they were locked behind that gentleman. These are your detailed plans. You start creating detailed plans. And you completely forget about the destination and why you started the project. There's a reason the term short termism has appeared fairly recently, because companies no longer plan for long term. They increasingly more and more plan for short term. Not five years, not three years, one week, a quarter, a month. 
which is real days, are applied. We're applying for one month, month of January, month of September. The, the problem with that is uh, the world will continue changing. Your plan will become irrelevant. So I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, Ten years ago, we started working with a company based out of Cambridge. Small outfit, uh, company was uh, building um, systems for houses um, to make them more secure. So, you know, sensors for doors, windows, alarms, smoke alarms, um, security cameras, um, all sorts of things. And the reason they were doing that is because they wanted, uh, they were geeks, and they just liked gadgets, but they thought, well, we can actually make lives of people easier because it wouldn't be a mishmash of different devices, it would be just something that they can have control over. And that company uh, became our client, as I said, 10 years ago. They've been our clients for about five years when we did um, an interesting experiment. We plotted on the horizontal line time, on the vertical line, the number of people they had in the team on our end, developers, everybody else. And what we noticed is the shape of the line repeated itself year after year after year after year. They would downsize almost to nothing around September, start growing slowly on the way to Christmas. They would reach peak around May and then it would go down again. Why was that happening? Because their long term goal was to create that ecosystem, but their short term situation kept changing. You know, the different players came to the market. IoT has made a name for it, Internet of Things. Nest came into the, uh, into the picture. The, uh, the world kept changing and they kept going. You know this company. Uh, it's now called British Gas and so the system is called Hive, which is smart thermostats, which are considered to be one of the uh, uh, best devices on the market with a whole ecosystem around them. And then the company was called Alert. They were bought by British Gas at some point because of their perseverance, because they created an ecosystem which was something that British Gas very much. <clears throat> okay, so we didn't outsource it. We uh, didn't create detailed plans. We kept our goal in mind. There's one last thing that you can do to make it fail, and that is never question your motives. Don't really question why you're doing some of you might recognize that famous one. A couple of weeks ago, actually last week, I was fortunate enough to be at, uh, at a conference where um, there were a number of really prominent speakers and uh, experts. Simon Sinek, who is the author of this concept, Start With Why, was one of the speakers, but there were also people like Martin Lindstrom, who is a very famous uh, marketing specialist, and Michael Porter, uh, well, I'm sure some of you might recognize from the famous Porter's Five Forces, which is a way to analyze your industry and uh, understand and map out what is competition. I was, it, it was, I felt, I felt like a school kid, you know, getting an autograph from, from my famous, from my favorite football player, because that's Michael Porter. I was sweating all of his five forces just a year ago. And, um, what they were talking about, very interestingly, overlapped because they were coming in from very different directions. Michael Porter is very much professor like, you know, economist, and Simon Sinek is very energetic, very uh, emotional speaker. Martin Lindstrom is a marketologist, market marketer, I think is the right term. But they were all saying the same thing um, the B2B concept, the B2C concept, is no longer there. What actually happens? What digital, what the change in the world did to us? We no longer buy from companies, we buy from people. So it's not B2B, it's not B2C, it's H to H, human to human. And that gives us, on one side, it gives us a huge challenge as business people and business leaders. On the other side, it gives us a huge leverage because 
they might not be able to grasp and understand completely our organization and the Kandesian organization. But we deal with people all the time. You know, it's not really that hard to understand others. You just need to ask yourself, what would I want in this situation? Why would I want to do that? So, yes, you might actually give GPs an app, but what do I need to do to make them want to use it? What problem do I solve for them? And, uh, you know, once you, once you did that, they will embrace it because it actually is something that they need. There's a clear reason why should I use it? Well, that's why, you know, it will actually make your life easier. Isn't that the best reason, the only reason? To do things for us as business people and business leaders. And with that, I'll leave. Thank you. Thanks very much.